I'm Anthony Iseko. I'm a professor of psychology at Chatham University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, associate editor for the Journal of Spirituality and Clinical Practice and a member of the Catholic Psychotherapy Association. I do research in clinical practice with religious populations such as priests, deacons, seminarians, and women religious. So I think this topic is is very kind of close to my heart, uh, both, per, both personally and professionally. I'm excited to be here and, and facilitate the conversation. Um, the conversation is being hosted by a longstanding partnership between the Institute for Human Ecology at the Catholic University of America and the National Catholic Partnership on Disability. Um, the Institute for Human Ecology is located at the Catholic University of America, is an interdisciplinary institute that is dedicated to bringing the riches of the Catholic intellectual tradition to bear in contemporary conversations. And the National Catholic Partnership on Disability works collaboratively to ensure meaningful participation of persons with disabilities in church and society. Um, I will now introduce our two expert panelists. Um, Dr. Thomas Plant is the Augustan Cardinal Bay University professor at Santa Clara University. He's a professor of psychology and religious studies and directs the Applied Spirituality Institute. He is also an adjunct clinical professor of psychology and behavioral science at Stanford University. He has published 29 books and, and maybe the 30th in the last few minutes here. He's so prolific. Um, and including most recently, a book that we will talk about today during our conversation, um, Spirituality Informed Therapy and Living Better with Spiritually Based Strategies That Work. Uh, Dr. Plant maintains a private practice as a licensed psychologist in Menlo Park, California, where he specializes in assessment and treatment of Catholic clerics and laypersons. Time Magazine referred to him as one of the three leading American Catholics in a cover story on clerical abuse in April 2002. So welcome, Dr. Plant. Good to see you. Um, and our second expert panelist is Father Dr. Innocent Ogasi, um, who works at Southdown Institute in Canada as of April 2020 uh, and is a member of the clinical team which is an institute that serves clergy, women and men religious, as well as lay ecclesial ministers of both the Catholic Church and some other Christian denominations. Um, he earned his doctorate in counseling psychology from Seton Hall University in 2010 and taught there as an adjunct professor uh, until 2014. He has ministered as a missionary, parochial vicar, and pastor to a diverse population in Africa and the United States. He has written uh, and published several psychological articles in professional and academic journals. Um, and he is fluent in both English and French. So we have a great panel here. Thank you, Father Innocent, for joining us as well. Welcome. All right, so I have uh, the great honor to throw some questions at these two panelists and get their expert insights as we go through a host of different topics. Um, and so I'm just going to jump right into it then. You know, the, the topic today, uh, Dr. Plan and Father Innocent is Catholic insights for mental health, faith-driven strategies. So let's just start from the top here. What does the Catholic Church have to offer people experiencing mental health concerns? Dr. Plan, why don't you start and then we'll bring it over to Father Innocent after that. Well, f f thank you so much, uh, Anthony. And it's a it's a great treat to be here. I'm very grateful for NCPD, uh, their invitation, as well as Catholic University's Institute for Human Ecology for the uh, for uh, putting this together. Very very grateful, and I'm very grateful to both Anthony and Father Innocent, uh, as they're both such dear colleagues and friends. And uh, it's it's just an honor to be to be with you. Um, you know, to, uh, to answer your question, um, I think it, it, the Catholic tradition and religious traditions in general have an awful lot of terrific wisdom and best practice that has been fine-tuned over many, many years and even centuries. And yet uh, the mental health community out there tends to be pretty secular and tends to get very, very little training 
in anything that has to do with spirituality and, and religion. And so some of these wonderful tools and wisdom and so forth can get ignored. And I think that's a huge problem. And so I think the Catholic tradition uh, uh, offers, and I think there's a great deal of, uh, of, of, of budding research that has uh, um, uh, underscored uh, what the church has to offer uh, in terms of a variety of things that can be very, very useful for people managing, struggling, coping with mental health concerns. And we can get into those details uh, as, as this um, workshop or seminar kind of uh, plays out. All right. Thank you. Father Inset, what would you like to add uh, uh, to that question? What does the Catholic Church have to offer people experiencing mental health concerns? Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Anthony, and also uh, 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 Tom, uh, for uh, uh, inviting me to participate in this um, panel. Um, as you rightly said, uh, Tom, uh, the Catholic Church has a long tradition of being like uh, the center for healing uh, and also for uh, wisdom. You know, down through the ages, there was a time when uh, people used to flock to the monasteries, you know, in, in the early centuries uh, just to get, get some education and also to uh, to share in the wisdom of of the of the monks uh, and, and the uh, of the time as well, and uh, and a lot of people then um, would sort of found their own vocations just through some of those interactions. And uh, more more recently, um, I would say that the church is now sort of like trying to remind. Uh, our members that uh, mental health is very, very important. Um, I think there is more recently the uh, this month um, the uh, USCCB uh, launched the mental health campaign and and which is like the first right and and I see a program like this as one of the ways that we can actually participate in that campaign. And so, uh, so this uh, panel uh, discussion uh, organized by the IHG and uh, NCPD um, is really um, one of the ways that um, we can promote and participate in that campaign. And so, um, so the, the church has a lot to offer. And when we talk about church, it's not only the church leaders, but as well as every member uh, both uh, clergy, religious men and women, and the laity, that we all are invited to be part of this movement, and so uh, and so we to become beneficiaries of this as well as be promoters of this. So, I'll stop there. Excellent. I'm just going to give you a, a quick break there, but I'm going to come back to you, Father Innocent, because you mentioned the recent campaign that the USCCB launched um, around mental health. And you're correct, it's it's the first that I'm aware of that the, the USCB, USCCB launched. And some of the um, goals of the campaign are to kind of decrease stigma of mental health and to provide a more pastoral response to the mental health crisis of the day for, for Catholics. Yeah. So I was wondering if you could kind of elaborate a little bit more on just how important that initiative is for, for Catholics and um, what are some ways that, as you mentioned, other people can get involved and be part of that initiative? Yes, um, thank you. Uh, so uh, uh, the, um, the two bishops that actually are sort of spearheading this movement, it is this campaign, uh, Archbishop uh, Gutziak and Bishop Barron. And so, uh, so the, in his address, um, Archbishop Gotziak, he he affirmed the fact that it's like this is the moment that uh, we need this, you know, this um, mental health um, services the most. 
And because he sort of observed that there is, you know, with after COVID or with COVID, you know, the um, the challenges that COVID exacerbated um, kind of are now more pronounced. And he also noticed that um, young people are even impacted more. And 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 as church, I would say that. Mental health has, you know, um, the services have always been there, but as, you know, Tom pointed out, a lot of the people, a lot of the service providers um, are um, secular. And I think it's mostly Catholic charities and a few religious communities, you know, or a few um, religious houses or uh, institutions that, have could offer such uh, services to others, and so uh, from what the bishops are um, are saying is that they want us, they want everyone to be part of this movement. First of all, to try to you know, as you said, Anthony, to try to reduce. Um, first of all, to raise awareness because a lot of times many people mi misunderstand. Uh, what mental health really is about, or even to uh, some people sometimes um, misunderstand what belongs to what may be termed as psychiatric treatments and then psychological treatment or counseling. You know? And so uh, just knowing the difference there, I think, helps us also in removing the stigma because a lot of times people don't want to seek mental health services because they uh, they associate it with, you know, maybe some uh, severe disorders that may require psychiatric treatment, and so um, so I will probably stop there for now, and then I give um, uh, Tom the opportunity to also respond. Yeah. Hey, thank you. Yeah, Tom, what did you think of the USCCB announcement and initiative, and um, how important do you think it is from from your perspective? You know, I was completely thrilled, and I think it's super important, because not only has there been this sort of, you know, kind of separate camps, you could say, of the religious community and the secular mental health community, but, but there's been sort of a reluctance in some respects to bridge these two worlds over the many, many years. And so just like sometimes uh, the, the, the Catholic world and the religious world in general have been kind of skeptical of of mental health of mental health professionals of these people that are are are, are trained in more secular environments, and so lots of times there really hasn't been the kind of collaboration and mutual support that we're starting to see. So when the USCCB came out with this initiative, frankly, I was just thrilled because it it sends a message to the community that you know we can work together that we can uh, the, the the professional uh, mental health uh, world um and the catholic world can be together in solidarity to try to help people with their various mental health concerns our world and our community is an experiencing what i would refer to as a mental health tsunami in that the surgeon general released at the end of 2021, an unprecedented advisory about mental health challenges that the community is experiencing, especially young people, and issues of anxiety and depression and suicidality and alcohol and substance abuse has just skyrocketed. And so the church offers a lot in, in order to help and we, to get blessings from the bishop uh, the bishops, um, I, I think, is such a wonderful step in the right direction. Yeah, I agree. It, and over the summer, uh, someone had asked me if um, if I knew of any resources from the USCCB about mental health, and I was looking on the website and couldn't find anything. And almost providentially, you know, just a couple months later, um, I learned of this uh, new initiative and. I know for a lot of people that I've spoken to about it, it was very validating, like, you know, the, for the church leaders to say, hey, we recognize this problem, we see it, um, and we are going to do something about it. It's a good step in the right direction. 
Um, Tom, you kind of talked about um, maybe some of the historical challenge there in terms of people who could come together, who can bridge the gap between religion, spirituality, and psychology, right? Um, both you and Father Innocent are two people who have who have tried to bridge the gap, have bridged the gap. So I want to talk a little bit about some of your experiences in that space. Um, Tom, I'm going to start with you. Um, you recently published a book that integrates um, Jesuit principles and spirituality into kind of a therapeutic approach. Um, can you give us a brief overview of the book and, and maybe the inspiration behind it? Yeah, sure. Happy to do so. Uh, so, yes, the first book is called uh, Spiritually Informed Therapy. I hope you don't mind me a shameless plug putting it up here. Uh, and this is really designed for mental health professionals or their students, you know, psychologists and social workers and marriage and family therapists and psychiatrists and nurses and so forth, uh, to be able to see how they can use Catholic principles in their uh, clinical work to help people, uh, and uh, whether they're Catholic or not Catholic or whatever, but we can use the wisdom of these principles. And then there's a second book that's a workbook. This is mostly for clients, patients, students, uh, uh, living better with spirituality-based uh, strategies at work. So this is more of a workbook that goes with it. And basically what I've done here is I uh, have taken what I see as being seven um, principles that are easily integrated into psychotherapy and mental health services, not just for Catholics, but also for really pretty much anybody. And they and I take them from uh, the Jesuit um, sort of uh, worldview or Jesuit spirituality. Now, I teach at Santa Clara University, a fine Jesuit institution, and I've been there for uh, 30 years now, and I can't help but be very much influenced by the Jesuits. However, this isn't unique to the Jesuits. Other, others would uh, probably find uh, 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 this very, very uh, familiar as well uh, in, in other parts of the, our Catholic world. And what these seven things are is, first, seeing God or the sacred in all things, embracing cura personalis, uh, basically care for the whole person, Three is use the uh, what we call the four D's of discernment and decision making. This is um uh, we can unpack this later if you wish, but this speaks to kind of how do we engage in reflection and discernment to make good decisions. Four is to use the examine, uh, which is a kind of an end of day kind of prayer and reflection. And how can we use that to help people um, in in terms of uh, their various issues? Um, the, uh, the fifth has to do with managing conflict between people with accommodation, humility, and the expectation of goodness. We live in very divisive times, as we all know, and where you where people seem to be screaming and sh um, shouting at one another, canceling one another. Uh, but how can we work with these challenges with, again, accommodation, humility, the expectation of goodness? How can we travel a path from moving from civility to hospitality to solidarity to mutuality and kinship with one another? And finally, how can we embrace ethical decision-making strategies? So these are seven principles that I kind of unpack in these books. And a good example, I think, is that first one about seeing God or the sacred or the face of Jesus in all. You know, with the, our divisive world out there, and the way we treat one another, not so respectfully or with much compassion, but if we can see the face of Jesus in others, if we can see the sacredness in others, it's hard to treat them so too badly. And so we can be more compassionate, respectful, embracing, loving, and all of that if we can see the sacred, the divine, or, or the face of Jesus in all. So, that, so that's it. That, this just gives you a flavor, I think, of some of these principles. Excellent. Thank you for the brief overview. I look forward to getting the book and applying it to my clinical practice for sure. Um, and we'll, you know, certainly have some time to come back to some of those principles and talk a little bit more about your book. Um, but back to you, Father Innocent, I want to just kind of give you an opportunity to talk about um, how you integrate your Catholic faith into your clinical practice and professional roles. Thank you, Anthony. Um... Well, one of the ways that I do that is, um, you know, that um, through my work, um, understanding 
um, the my faith is positive looking kind of um, it promotes hope, peace, love, and so all the all all the uh, virtues that psychology will identify, you know, as places that people need to uh, to be or situations or context where they can thrive. And so, uh, so having that already, um, you know, being promoted in the faith, you know, and knowing that, uh, you know, with our human condition, um, you know, that none of us is perfect and we're always striving to be, be better versions of ourselves. And so, uh, so there are times that we may uh, be required to uh, go outside of um, uh, the sacraments that we receive or even the pastoral um, counseling that we receive from our priests and nuns and spiritual directors to embrace more uh, or to seek out um, mental health services from professionals, you know, because they are more trained in some of the uh, problematic behaviors that we experience in our day-to-day -day -day lives. And also, um, the, with the scope of practice as well, for example, when a couple who may be experiencing some challenges in their married life uh, approach a priest to help them, um, there is, in terms of scope of practice, there is an extent to which the priest can go with them. But then the priest then will need to, or, or the nun may need to refer them out to a professional uh, who can really help them better uh, because the professional is trained in that way. And so, um, so in as much as um, we, it's not like either or, but like collaboratively, you know, while supporting the couple or the people. And then also uh, supporting, encouraging them also to seek, you know, the right treatment. Um, another uh, another example of that too is, uh, for example, when it comes to um, scrupulosity, um, and uh, which can be seen, you know, as a form of obsessive compulsive traits or obsessive compulsive disorder. And there, um, a lot of people sort of suffer from that, where um, they uh, they may suffer from either moral or religious obsessions, or kind of repeat some rituals over and over again. And based on their belief that maybe the number of times they do that, you know, repeat those rituals, and now we help them to attain maybe the level of perfection that they are seeking. And so uh, so that, for example, uh, can really be very problematic for a lot of people who are struggling to, uh, to improve their lives and also practice the faith as best as they can uh, while dealing with those uh, personal challenges as well. So there, for example, uh, even though sometimes if we go to confession, so many times, uh, but uh, they may not experience much changes in their behavior or improvement in their behavior due to the other aspect of the struggle they have. And so by for them, working with a professional, a mental health counselor or psychologist or uh, social worker, then they may be able to get the necessary help to be able to... Um, actually remedy that or improve on that or reduce the impact of uh, of that um, trait of those traits scrupulosity on their whole life on their mental life excellent thank you father in a sentence so you know between you and tom you kind of really talked about different ways to integrate one's faith into your clinical practice you know whether it be with specific principles um, spirituality kind of concept, so as well as just maybe understanding um, how psychologists, mental health professionals can work with clergy around referrals and getting people the right service for the right kind of um, issue that they're experiencing and, and a kind of a, a overall kind of conceptualization on how you view the person. So 
it sounds like, correct me if I'm wrong, it is possible to kind of bridge this gap between religion, spirituality, and faith uh, with you two being uh, two examples of that. You're right. <laughs> you're, yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And I think, you know, that we can really be better. And I think Catholic therapists out there, we all can be better at be basically, you know, saying that we're, you know, Catholic, loud and proud, but also say we also are going to practice evidence-based best practices that have been found to uh, be to work with people. And um, I think we're, at least in my, my lab, uh, the research that I do, uh, and and I know some that uh, some others do too. Uh, uh, in, involves uh, uh, taking some of these Catholic principles and subjecting them to randomized clinical trials to be able to demonstrate uh, that they actually work. And for example, we've been doing that of late with the examine. Uh, we've got a variety of projects, randomized clinical trials, to be able to demonstrate that the examine actually does work not only in a, in a Catholic context, but also in a, in a secular context, too. Uh, and we're doing that with substance abuse um, patients and, and, and other, other populations. And so I think we, as Catholic therapists, um, should embrace our, 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 our faith tradition, but also embrace uh, the standards of evidence-based uh, best practices. Um, uh, and I think both are, are equally important. Yeah. I agree. Um, let me just stick with um, the topic of counseling here for another question, okay? Um, I don't know about you two, but over the last five years or so, I've just been inundated with uh, questions from Catholics asking to be referred to a Catholic mental health professional for counseling. Um, so could you talk a little bit more about like what it means to be a Catholic mental health professional and why do you think it's so important for a Catholic to see a Catholic in counseling? Father Anderson, why don't you start with that? Okay. Thanks, Anthony. Um, I think one of the things to be said is uh, for a Catholic counselor, um, so there, we are taking it for granted that the Catholic counselor understands the faith, okay? And and then that he or she uh, uh, um, is also um, aware of some of the challenges that may come up, you know, for, uh, for people, for members of the Catholic faith um, in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, whether it has to do with trying to live out their faith or dealing with the day-to-day -day challenges in the society um, and trying to make sense of it all, or even uh, even at the parish level, kind of in with relationships, kind of trying to collaborate with other other Catholics, you know, at their in in their in, at their parish as volunteers and so on, and so. Um, so when uh, when people go to when people want to meet with or go to Catholic counselors, because they believe that they want someone who understands their faith, they want someone who will not uh, maybe minimize or ridicule their faith as not important to them, and they want someone who can understand and affirm. Uh, their faith and also the their goodness and their ability to want to be you know practice their faith to the best way possible to them. and which sometimes uh, they feel like they could not that someone who is uh, who does not have a Catholic understanding or someone who does not integrate religious or spiritual experiences into their practice, um, may not have that. And so there, I think, uh, that's where I feel like, uh, you know, the, your book, um, Tom, you know, kind of helping clinicians to kind of remind them about those aspects uh, of how they can, of the importance of integrating, uh, working with what the client brings to them. What, you know, even sometimes when they do not, you know, share the same 
kind of faith tradition, but respecting the clients and also respecting what the client brings with them and affirming that and working with them, I think it's even more important. Very good. Thank you. And that was a nice handoff over to you, Tom, as well. So why don't you take it from there? Yeah, I, I would just add, I, I, um, uh, Father Innocent, I think, uh, answered the question so beautifully, but I'll just add two uh, other thoughts to it. One is that, as we probably know, there's been something called Christian counseling for many, many years, decades. And that has basically, Christian counseling has, I think, is basically has been come out of the Protestant or uh, non-denominational Christian community. And it was particularly, um, I think, attractive for evangelical uh, Christians. Uh, and, and that's been around forever. And so of Catholic psychotherapy, I think, is this sort of a, a, a variation on that theme, if you will. And as, as uh, Father Innocent said, you know, it's, it sort of speaks to the people that will, you know, hopefully understand and appreciate and respect uh, their faith and their faith tradition. Now, the other thing I think we should mention is that, you know, the Catholic world is a very large tent. As, as we know, there's about a, there's over a billion Catholics in the world, and about 23% of the American population claim that they are uh, Catholic identified. But, but as we know, it's very, very diverse in all sorts of ways. And so sometimes the Catholic can be sort of a project, a projective test, if you will, like a Rorschach. What does that really mean? Uh, Catholics can look very, very different. Conservative, liberal, progressive, you know, traditional. Uh, they're influenced by all sorts of different um, things. And so any of us who have been, uh, uh, and, and this is true of other traditions too, whether it's, you know, Jewish or Protestant or whatever, you've got a lot of diversity within that tent of Catholicism. And I've certainly had uh, patients, Catholic patients, for example, that come to me and they will say, oh, you don't seem very Catholic because you've been so influenced by the Jesuits. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, and, and so, uh, you know, so sometimes uh, we have to be mindful that when someone says Catholic, they could mean a bunch of different things. Yeah, good points, good points. Um, I do want to offer just a couple quick follow-ups to what you both said. Number one, um, you know, Father Innocent, to your point about having a counselor that just respects someone's faith. I mean, that that seems maybe like a tiny little um, gesture from a counselor, but it actually has a, a great impact on building trust and rapport and the therapeutic relationship. And kind of to your point, Tom, the science behind that is you know, across different faith traditions, when a counselor is able to bridge that gap and and uh, show that respect and cultural competence towards one's religion, spirituality, it really leads to better outcomes for, for clients of all different faiths, including Catholics, in terms of staying in counseling longer, feeling better uh, in terms of symptoms, and um, terminating with, with greater satisfaction. So, um, that's uh, a small but very impactful point that I didn't want to be lost in the conversation. Um, and then secondly, um, you know, in terms of like practical resources, which um, I understand is a, 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 an important emphasis here in the discussion, there's a couple of websites out there that can help people find um, Catholic uh, mental health professionals. One's called catholictherapist.com. Uh, they have a nice search directory there. Um, it's, it's nationwide. Uh, and then the other uh, search direct directories through the Catholic Psychotherapy Association. So if you go to catholicpsychotherapy.org, there's a directory uh, and you can search there as well. So I wanted to highlight those resources for people who might be looking for a Catholic mental health professional. All right, I'm going to um, move on from from counseling here for a bit and just talk about a couple of like, Catholic things, okay? Um, and so let's let's start with confession. Boy, what what what's more what's more Catholic than the sacrament of confession? Um, Father Innocent, you you've probably been on both sides of the confessional boot, so to speak. You know? um, so what? Um, what are the psychological benefits to receiving uh, confession? Thank you, um, Anthony. Um, I think one of one of the um, psychological benefits, which I also see as one of the spiritual benefits, 
is actually just receiving feeling forgiven. You know, that experience of having been forgiven and uh, forgiven one's faults, forgiven one's sins, forgiven one's mistakes. And, and, and also like with the priest there representing both the community and being the channel of God's grace in the confessional pool, I think they both comes together, right? And, and so that experience of feeling forgiven and feeling that now I am reconciled to the fold, I'm reconciled to my community, to my religious family. And so that gives me the opportunity, like a second chance to, you know, to keep working on improving myself in order to overcome what whatever faults or mistake or sin, you know, that led me to confession. So that's one. Then the other aspect too is uh, feeling loved. Um, you know, so uh, feeling loved, loved by God, uh, you know, and loved by uh, by the community, and and that is also one of the things that draws me there, right? For me to in you know, confessing and having that um, experience of not only being forgiven, but that I'm being forgiven because I am loved by God, you know, and so uh, and that that God does not judge me as the others would judge me, you know, because with judgment, um, you know, when judgment comes in or even with guilt uh, or shame that goes with the fault that one is going to the priest to confess. Um, so for me, being on the other side, you know, and I see that there is no point in trying to beat someone down when that person is already down. You know, what the Lord does is to lift us up when we are down, you know. And so uh, so I see that as part of what confession does. And, and also, like... Um, when someone, even after confession, and some people still carry the guilt or they feel they cannot forgive themselves. And so that's something also that we need some help with counseling, you know, to get over that particular challenge that that person is facing. And, and also, uh, in that same line, uh, there are some, uh, some problems that, or faults that, or sins that people, uh, some people, maybe we confess over and over again, and it's like they're having so much difficulty getting over that. So uh, they receive the absolution, they receive forgiveness for that sin. At the same time, uh, they now for them to improve on on their lives, it's important for them to get professional help uh, without. It's not that they're going to confess. They are not just confessing to the, uh, you know, to the counselor, but rather they are maybe they are trying to get the tools and strategies that probably they were not aware of, and probably that the priest also may not be aware of because it has to do with professional work. And so there, then they can now implement some of those tools to help themselves get out of that, you know, uh, vicious cycle, you know that that particular fault or sin um, uh, kind of has locked them into and that had been stuck in as well. Mm. So, Yeah, you, I, I think you might have a lot more people coming to confession to you now because you, you really laid out a beautiful vision of, of, the, of the gifts that one can receive from confession. Um, and I liked how you kind of added in the fact that, yeah, um, counseling can help where maybe confession um, stops in terms of, you know, forgiving, you know, getting forgiveness for sins. And then there's can maybe continued work that can happen in counseling as well. So over to you, Tom, um, what do you think about confession? Have you seen any of your clients benefit from going to confession or have you have any read any research in, in that area? Yeah, no, I think this is another great example of sort of some of the, um, of the wisdom of the Catholic Church. Uh, and the brilliance of the Catholic Church to offer confession. As you know, not all religious traditions have that kind of um, experience. 
because um, I think research has ultimately helped to support the notion that when people are struggling and they have um, troubles that uh, and deficits and um, uh, problems, to be able to go talk to somebody about that in, in an anonymous way or not, um, and to be able to receive some support, and in this case, receive absolution, and to hear the words from somebody who represents, you know, the church and so forth, that your your sins are forgiven. And uh, this is powerful. And we do know that there is research that speaks to the the kind of the power of being able to kind of fess up, if you will, to talk about it with a a, a caring other, you know. And so I'd love to see some randomized trials at some point conducted where you randomize people to, let's say, confession versus no confession, like a weightless group or a, or, or a control group or some other kind of techniques. And it, it, we, could we really see the power of confession if it was subjected to a randomized trial? Um, I, I, we, we could do that. I mean, there are methodological and um, ethical issues that have to be overcome. But, uh, but I think it's another great example of the, kind of the brilliance and the wisdom of some of our Catholic traditions. I have had patients that have come to me, a lot of patients over the years who have come to me, because they started off going to their priest in confession. And then that priest said, you know, after the confession, they say, you know, I think you should see a, a mental health professional, and I have someone I can refer you to uh, who is Catholic, who respects the Catholic world, and, and then they can um, uh, talk with you in, in, uh, in order to try to deal with some of these problems. And th this has included problems like pornography, sex offending, marital affairs, and so forth. And I think that can be a, gr a great possibility when you can have collaboration between the cleric and mental health community to help kind of pass maybe the person off, give make them uh, that referral, and they're more likely to follow through with that referral if it was encouraged by their cleric. Mm -hmm. Very good. Uh, good points there, Tom. I appreciate it. And, you know, hopefully there's some um, uh, graduate students in psychology on the call. You got some ideas for dissertations as well. Uh -huh. Um, that you can hopefully follow up on. Um, I'm going to go from one sacrament to the next here and talk about Mass and the Eucharist, okay? Um, yeah. You know, Mass attendance, um, which is considered like once per week in our tradition, has been linked to all kinds of mental health benefits, you know, decreased depression, increased meaning in life. The list kind of goes on and on. I could list a whole bunch of positive outcomes there. Um, and, and these studies have been done by, um, you know, secular researchers out of Harvard University, other, um, other prominent universities. Um, and they're not, you know, small studies they are large scale, um, large sample, rigorous longitudinal studies. So things that you can really hang your hat on. What do you think are kind of like the key ingredients though, to kind of getting the most out of going to mass from a mental health perspective, you know, other than just, you know show up and, and hope something good happens? Are there, are there things that people can do to be more of an active agent in going to Mass and, and having those mental health benefits? Tom, why don't we start with you? Yeah, you know, right, you're right, Tony. There's a lot, there's a boatload of research that has supported the attending regular spiritual religious services, with it, whether it's in the Catholic tradition or other traditions, uh, can have tremendous mental health benefit. And uh, that research has been going on for a number of years, uh, and not just by, you know, the Catholic crowd, but also uh, the secular and uh, non-Catholic uh, uh, religious crowd as well. So that research is pretty well established. Now, less and less people are going to Mass, and less and less people are going to religious services. That trend started before the pandemic, and it just got accelerated with the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there's less people taking advantage of that. Now, of course, there's a variety of research projects that have demonstrated what are the elements of these services that are therapeutic. And there's a variety of them. Some of it has to do with internal versus external religiosity. Internal religiosity is sort of prayer, meditation, reflection, all of that. And external is just sort of showing up, showing up. 
and schmoozing with people, maybe, um, you know, talking to people with, you know, donuts and coffee afterwards and, uh, 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 and, and that kind of thing, but just showing up. And there's benefits on both sides, the internal religiosity as well as the external religiosity. And so we can unpack that research and it demonstrates there's uh, many elements that it makes it therapeutic, ritual, music, support of others, feeling like you're part of something bigger than yourself, prayer, meditation, all of it. It all it all helps. And so one of the challenges I think we have, especially among young people, is a lot of folks will say, well, I don't get much out of mass, or I don't find it compelling enough. Or, or some research, uh, research has said when it comes to music and homilies, the Catholics don't score as well as some of the other religious traditions. And I totally, you know, totally get that. And so we have to try to have our preaching uh, be, uh, be very, very good, the music, and, and the hospitality matters too. And so um, we, we really got to pay attention to uh, those elements to try to encourage and bring more people uh, to the table. Excellent. And uh, how about you, Father Innocent? Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Anthony. Um, without repeating all that you said, Tom, uh, I think what I'll add is that, first of all, uh, to go to Mass, we need to be intentional about it. You know that, yeah. And then that I'm coming as I am, you know, and that I'm going to this celebration of a relationship. You know, and the relationship with God, relationship through Christ, the relationship as church, right? Uh, so that's also so as the family of God. So, uh, so I also like like to liken the mass to the domestic, you know, um, dinner at table, you know, wh where. You know the family comes together to uh, to celebrate. You know to eat together and then you know talk about their day and you know if so a family that really has sometimes it's, it's become a luxury even for families to sit together at table. You know with the pace that you know our world has set up these days and so uh, so with that as well when we come together. Then we we listen to the word, you know, and also then we share, participate at the table of the Lord, and it is God giving Himself to us. So uh, when we come as we are to to mass, and as you mentioned, Tom, you know that yes, uh, everything, every aspect of mass is very important, and so uh, sometimes it may not take much to distract someone from their full participation in the mass. For example, whether it's a homily. Or maybe some songs, and and also like um, the size of the times as well. Having songs that can also that people of different generations can relate to is equally important, right? And so, uh, so we've heard of people, some people not go, especially young people, not attending mass or participating at mass because they could not relate. So it's a question of us to sit down with them and see how can we minister to them or how can together we find ways to make our celebration more, you know, um, respond more, to respond better to their own needs. And, and so, uh, and with regards to mental health is that it is when we go to Mass that we find the nourishment that we need to help us face each day or face the challenges we encounter each day. So, uh, so the, you know, attending mass, you know, uh, reg more regularly uh, is very helpful. And it also helps us to refocus our day and also to, uh, to plan better, knowing that we're not alone. You know, we are a part of the community. Thank you. So I, I like, your eloquent answers to those questions, both about confession and mass, because in a lot of ways, like what our parents and grandparents told us was right, go to mass, go to confession. But you both kind of laid out the specific reasons why. 
um, going to mass and going to confession can be helpful and in how we can be active agents and getting the most out of those two sacraments that the Catholic Church offers to us on a, on a regular basis and for free. Um, so we have about five more minutes before I open this up for questions from the participants. So this last question here is about some practical resources and tools, okay? So, and if you could direct your your answer to the participants here with us. Um, what are some practical resources, books, websites, apps um, that you can recommend for Catholics in, in terms of helping uh, with their mental health or around mental health topics? Tom, would you like to start with that one? Sure. You know, sure. And Anthony, I think you've already mentioned a couple, for example, like the Catholic Psychotherapy Association, the CatholicTherapist.com. Um, also talking to clerics. I mean, clerics usually, at least my experience, uh, 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 are connected to mental health uh, members in their local community, and they may have people uh, who uh, they refer to, who they've worked with in the past, that they like, they get along with, or what have you. Uh, so either the uh, local parish or the local um, uh, di uh, uh, diocese uh, uh, office, or or if there's a, a Catholic uh, university or uh, 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 nearby, uh, they may have a counseling center where they, they may not be able to see you because they maybe only service students or faculty or staff, but but they may know the, the local community. And so um, I think there are those resources. Um, again, uh, I'm, I'm sort of shamelessly plugging my books uh, that we talked about earlier about spiritually informed therapy, but particularly for regular folk living better with spirituality-based strategies at work. It's a workbook. Uh, I think that can okay, that can certainly help. Um, I, there, there. Are, I think the thing is, is that there are also apps that people might be interested in. Um, uh, I use, for example, the Examine app. There's several Examine apps. Uh, I, I use one of those. There's other kind of Catholic apps called like a Halo and and others. Uh, 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 for those, I noticed in some of the questions uh, 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 already by the uh, by the audience. Uh, some people were wondering about LBGQ uh, kinds of issues, and uh, Father Jim Martin's outreach uh, newsletter uh, uh, might be a good resource. So, so I think a good place to start, because you know, at the end of the day, a lot of people first go to the web um, or something like that, and that might all be helpful to get some basic information. But having a personal referral, uh, I think, can be very, very helpful. And uh, you can go to your local parish, see if there's uh, uh, someone on staff that can be helpful or the local diocese. Nowadays, after the Dallas Charter in 2002, pretty much every diocese has a, um, some, a child protection coordinator who tends to be a social worker. And so um, they may have connections, uh, not just around child protection, but just in general about mental health services in the local area that are kind of Catholic friendly. So I think there's a lot out there um, uh, uh, that's available to people um, if they can uh, if they can uh, pursue pursue their interests specific to their their individual needs. Great, thank you, Tom. How about you, Father Innocent? Um, the, yeah, I think the other one that I would like to talk about is the, with Catholic charities. And Tom, you've already talked about contacting the diocese and chancery or the pastoral center, so they may have a list of people, or even pastors, you know, some parishes may have a list of potential um, uh, mental health providers in, in the local area. Um, also, uh, one of the things I noticed also is that first and foremost, um, families have a big role to play when it comes to mental health of their family member, uh, especially in terms of support. You know, because uh, it's one thing that the person is already dealing with the problem and another for the person to feel isolated or not loved or not, you know, or that they see themselves as the problem, you know. And, and so, um, so it's important for the families and friends of the person to, to help that person understand that they are with them in that, in their struggles and, and also that Sometimes I believe that some mental health providers do also um, welcome even families, like even engaging in family therapy, you know, so um, those are some of the ways. And then also, so I believe that some 
um, uh, some of the websites of some psychological associate state psychological associations or mental health psychological uh, counseling associations uh, may also have um, possible um, maybe options for referrals or that if someone contacts them or visits their website, then they may actually have some um, some uh, maybe get some more options from them or find out and they can call to request for someone who, you know, um, works with people with religious, you know, from a religious background. Yes. Thank you both. Um, I will add just a few of my favorite go-to resources, and then I'm going to go into the Q&A bank here from the participants. Okay. So few things that I found that can be helpful for um, Catholic clients is um, there's a really good book called The Catholic Guide to Depression by Aaron Carity, who's a psychiatrist in your neck of the woods, Tom, out there in California. Um, really good book. Um, Gregory Popchek has written a book called uh, Unworried, which is a Catholic perspective on anxiety. So cover a lot of ground between depression and anxiety in those two books. Um, you mentioned the Halo app. Um, the Halo app has a mental health series um, where uh, mental Catholic mental health professionals talk about stress, anxiety, sexuality, addiction, uh, relationships, um, and have given a series of really short talks and experiential exercises that that you can access through the app. Um, and um, one of the other websites that I go to pretty regularly now is called soulsandhearts.com. It's it's uh, run by two Catholic psychologists. They have podcasts, they have blog posts, articles, um, and uh, kind of regular updates. They even have courses uh, on how to find a Catholic psychologist. So they cover a lot of ground. Uh, and a lot of their material is, is free. Some things you do have to pay for, but I do like that website too. Um, all right, well, let's get into some of the questions here from the participants, all right? Um, talking about your experience in counseling here or in, in counseling others, what do you do whenever um, a, a client comes to you and has felt maybe in past counseling experiences their, their spirituality, their faith has been pathologized by a secular counselor or psychologist? Well, well, that's a great question, you know, and I've had plenty of that. I've seen that. Uh, I um, sa Sadly and tragically, there is a lot of prejudice and discrimination out there uh, 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 against uh, religious, spiritual uh, people, including um, Catholic people, and there's a lot of examples of that, and that, I think that's a tragedy. Uh, we're, we're getting better as a, as a mental health profession uh, or the mental health missions around uh, being respectful of diversity and uh, and, uh, you know, issues of diversity, equity, inclusion, and so forth. We're certainly getting better, but we're not quite there. And religion and spirituality can often be kind of the last last uh, acceptable prejudice uh, that's out there. And so that's unfortunate. Uh, we have to realize that therapists, whoever they are and wherever they're located, are, are flawed human beings. We're all flawed human beings. And unfortunately, uh, people can get hurt and get put off by uh, by some of these professionals, but I hope that they can understand that um, that uh, uh, there are other professionals out there who would be would treat them very very differently, much more respectfully, much more compassionately, uh, and will um, um, journey with them in solidarity around their uh, faith related issues uh, as it impacts their uh, or, or or is associated with their mental health concerns. And so, um, basically, uh, you know, don't don't judge the whole profession by by one person. Yeah, Father Anderson, you want to add to that? Thank you, Tom. Yes. Um, first of all, I, I really want to acknowledge um, that in Maine today, uh, since last night, people have really been struggling with the recent shootings there, and so um, I, I want to acknowledge that and also to tell. Uh, you know, uh, participants from Maine that our hearts are with you and uh, we're praying with you and and uh, we pray for the souls that have been lost and we pray also that um, that 
pe that people will find their peace and and also that if um, if anyone is really struggling very hard, that you don't have to do it alone, but please, you know, seek out someone to talk to and also um, to seek out even uh, any counselor or your priest as well, you know, or even come together to talk, even if it's just to, to vent or share together, you know, um, that that is really very helpful. Yeah, and so um, to, to the question itself, um, yeah, as Tom said, it's really unfortunate. Yeah. And one thing too that I would like to add there is that uh, when in, in seeking a counselor or a psychologist, it's also important to know that, you know, uh, maybe within the first few sessions that you're having with the person, to also evaluate for yourself and see if it's the right fit or not. If it is not the right fit, there is no need to continue with that person, you know, but to find some, you know, try somewhere else and until you find the one that really works for you, right? So, um, and it's it's true that uh, there are people out there who do not, you know, who maybe have difficulty working with someone who is faith-based and it would be easy, it would have been better for them to acknowledge that and refer that person to someone that they know would not harm that person. But sometimes we also need humility to acknowledge that. Thank you, Bo. Um, so this question, I, I, I believe, is a follow-up to a point you made, Tom, around, um, you know, when a Catholic has uh, maybe a, a mental health kind of concern or challenge and they go to the, their parish seeking some resources and support and they sit down with the, the priest to kind of get some resources. Um, this question is, um, are you aware of um, any kind of training or formation that priests receive on how to address those mental health issues that are presented to them? Um, because there seems to be a need to integrate good evidence-based mental health with the faith. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And I've, I've talked to so many clerics uh, over the years who will say to me that they wish they got, you know, a, a, a master's degree or some something in counseling or something like that, because they find themselves doing more and more of that kind of work where people come to them with not just their, you know, faith-based related issues and questions or what have you, but also just, you know, their marital difficulties, their problems with their kids, their experience with uh, anxiety or depression, disability, whatever it is. And and so many will say, geez, you know, I, I wish I had more mental health training myself. And I certainly know some people like Father Innocent, for example, who is both a priest as well as a psychologist. And in a lot of ways, that's a great gift uh, when, when, you can, when you can find someone like Father Innocent who kind of can wear both hats. Um, and so... Um, uh, uh, now, the, 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 I, I do think that as far as I, my experience, and maybe, uh, Anthony, since you work closely with seminaries uh, your, yourself as well, it's, it, it, you, and Father Innocent does as well, is we're seeing kind of more attention to these issues in seminary um, training uh, uh, and, and compared to the old days. And so hopefully uh, uh, that can be very helpful. Of course, we all have to stay within our area of competence and expertise or stay within our lane. I mean, most clerics are not mental health professionals. Most mental health professionals are not clerics. And so we we got to be careful to stay within our lane and work collaboratively in consultation with others to provide the best service for um, parishioners and so forth. Hey, Father Innocent, your popularity is going way up here. <laughs> as it should, as it should. In, in baseball, you're called the five-tool player. You know, so you're five -tool power. Um, are you aware of any particular training that priests get on mental health issues? Um, I would say for it's minimal. Um, for those that have taken maybe some courses in pastoral counseling, then that may be some, some of the elements, or even in spiritual direction. That may be some skills but it's not to the level of professional, you know, or working with people, you know, um, uh, to the extent of professional counselors or psychologists or, or, be, um, 
or social workers as well. Well, you know, so, um, so yeah, it's, it's true. And as Tom said, um, sometimes, you know, like even in, in here, in my work with, you know, here at, at Southdown, sometimes you hear some of the, some of the, uh, uh, participants say a resident say something like, oh, I wish I learned that in the seminary. I wish I learned this in the seminary, you know, and it, and, and that's sort of like, it's refreshing to hear that, you know, so I feel like, uh, we still, it kind of, there is hope for the future, you know, that, um, you know, with your work also, Anthony and uh, Tom, you know, that uh, diocesans can benefit really from that collaboration, you know, that uh, Catholic professors and, you know, and uh, clinicians can collaborate together uh, with, you know, the seminaries to actually uh, uh, train some of the seminarians uh, as on their, in their formation programs uh, to be more aware of you know, being able to, even if it's just being able to discover or uh, discern and identify, you know, what's a problem that someone may be going through to be able to refer that person to a professional. I think that in itself is very important. All right. Thank you both. Um, there's a few questions about that research we were talking about in terms of health, uh, mass attendance, impacting mental health. The research that I was thinking about when we were talking about that comes out of Harvard University. There's um, an Institute of Human Flourishing, it's called, and they have a nice website and uh, a tab specifically on uh, their church attendance um, research. And those would be the studies I would direct you to for that. Um, this is probably our last question, and I'm going to ask for a, a briefer uh, briefer response to be mindful of the time. Okay. Um, there's a few questions about, um, the emergence of mental health ministries and dioceses and parishes. What do you think of those ministries and how can they be helpful to kind of, um, uh, parishioners, um, on the ground there? Well, I'll get started. Um, I, you know, I think it's a great movement. I, I think it's a great to have um, something right there in the local parish sounds sounds terrific. Uh, uh, as long as it's done um, with certain uh, th thoughts in mind, one is that we all can learn something about, um, if you uh, want to call it mental health first aid, you could say. I mean, all of us could learn something about, you don't have to be a mental health professional to know something about anxiety and depression and disabilities and, and substance abuse and stuff like that. And certainly on college campuses like my own, uh, where we're asking all all professors, whether they teach math or or chemistry or, or whatever, to learn something about sort of mental health first aid. So I think that that part is good. The other part is that we always have to stay within our lane. You know, we, uh, if uh, you know if we're you know licensed mental health professionals can can do things that non-licensed mental health professionals cannot do. Clerics can do things. So I think we all, if it's done well. I think it could be a terrific trend to have something there right on site to to go to to get some help and to get some good referrals too. Yes. And for and for me, uh, what I will add is that I think um, I, some of the participants actually on this on this um, panel uh, discussion uh, are Catholic clinicians. And so, uh, so what I'll say, my uh, what I would encourage them to do, if you're still listening to us, is that you can be a great resource to your parish, or even to neighboring parishes. Uh, sometimes, I mean, like people can come together, and then uh, even with your pastor or uh, your priest to organize, even if it's just a mental health day. You know, to and talk to people and enlighten them about, even if it's anxiety or depression or just so, starting somewhere, and that would be tremendous help. You know, to um, to the parishioners and to the people there as well. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, I just taught a, a class this morning on strength-based kind of approaches, and so those of you who are Catholic mental health professionals, you can definitely use your strengths in parishes and dioceses to kind of address this urgent need 
um, across the country in all the dioceses. So that brings us to the end of our discussion panel. Father Innocent, Dr. Plant, I thank you so much for um, your expertise and insights and wisdom and participation in the panel. Um, I want to thank Catholic University and um, the National um, uh, Catholic Partnership on Disability for, for hosting the event. Uh, all the participants for for attending and all the great questions that were asked. I apologize we didn't have time to get to every single question um, out there, but we covered a lot of ground there. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over um, for a final closing. While we're waiting, can I just say thank you to Anthony for, for his efforts here. Yes. Thanks, Father Innocent. Thank you for Julia and all those who participated, uh, Catholic University, as well as NCPD. And please check out the ncpd.org website for mental health and illness resources. Uh, uh, again, ncpd.org. Very grateful for all of our time together and, uh, and, 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 and uh, very, very grateful for Anthony and Father Innocent in particular. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you. And nothing left to say. Thank you so much, all for your Have a great day, everybody. Thank you.